Kenyatta University, either Kenyatta University or Jomo Kenyatta University, one of them has started a program in medical engineering. You can confirm this from the website. I also suspect that another university might be thinking the same way. So very soon we are going to have at least two, three programs offering degrees in medical engineering. Obviously, when they come in, they will start in a small way. So you can expect that only very few students will be admitted to the program. Now, let me go a little faster. I have another question here. Does the technical university offer all the courses offered by the other universities on their specific courses? Now, no. First of all, not all universities offer the same courses in the whole country. All of us are biased in certain directions. There are the so-called traditional universities like now Nairobi, Kenyatta, Moi University. They try to offer everything. Those universities try to offer everything in every field. Eh? But technical university, Nairobi, uh, Nairobi, that is TUK, Technical University of Kenya, Technical University of Mombasa, we were created to offer programs that are largely technology oriented. So we try to shy away from programs that are not defined as technology oriented. For example, you will not find us teaching medicine, we don't teach dentistry, we don't teach agriculture. We don't teach a vet medicine, for example. We teach a lot of science. We teach a lot of engineering and related disciplines. I have a suspicion that the Technical University of Kenya is already admitting more students to study engineering than any other university in the land. That is excluding the diploma students. But if you look at the website of KUCCPS and our own website, you will notice that we are offering a much, much bigger variety or programs in engineering than any other university already in the land. That is our main uh, focus, and I know Mombasa is doing the same. Then another one is, if somebody wants to do aeronautical engineering, is it enough that you have to do geography? No, you don't have to do geography uh, to do aeronautical engineering. Aeronautical engineering is the core subjects that we're looking at. You must have mathematics, you must have uh, physics. You also must have chemistry. The fourth subject can be anything, can be biology, can be um, geography, can be history, can be business. So you don't have to have geography, but it is a good idea if you have geography, because when you come to aeronautical engineering, one of the things they will teach you about is navigation. And navigation requires that you understand something about how the world is constructed and how to find your way in the air. Just try to imagine, I always tell people, just try to imagine that, you see, the way an aircraft is piloted, the pilot up there does not see much. They only look at instruments and they have to understand very much how the maps function. So when you are up there, you could as well close your eyes and try to pilot the aircraft because you are only seeing clouds. And yet you must travel thousands and thousands of kilometers in the middle of the night and land at the place where you were supposed to land, where you have never been before, and land there on time. The only thing that is helping you is that you understand navigation systems. How long will it take to pursue a course in he says, somebody says neurosurgery. I really wish that you ask this question to the person who spoke after me on Wednesday because he was a medical doctor. But I will venture into this. First, you will have to go and do the general degree in medicine, which in our country is called Bachelor of Medicine and Bachelor of Surgery. That is a six year program. In, it used to be five years. But until I think about one or two years ago, we have extended to six years, which is actually what it was ever supposed to be. Because in the past, when you were the A levels, you did five years in medical school. And at the University of Nairobi, it was just compromised to make it five so that students could work more hours in a year. But it was found out that students were getting stressed by having to do a lot of time in a year. So it is now six years. After you've done six years and you've graduated with Bachelor of Medicine, Bachelor of Surgery, remember there are two degrees in one, then you go back to medical school 
and you will do three years and normally get a master of medicine degree which is called a specialization at that time you probably specialize in surgery and then you go further for at least another one year and you sub-specialize into neurosurgery i'm saying that you cannot expect to graduate to become a neurosurgeon in less than you can see this is six years plus three years that is nine plus at least one more year you are looking at 10 years in the very middle now thank you very much thank you so much for that very clear and direct responses and i believe uh, professor have answered very many questions that we have not even been raised i can see very ambitious young men and women who are looking forward to get into the world of engineering and i know we have questions that they need some clarification but i have not taken more i'm not taking more questions so i would request only one scholar only one to give this advice to our guest who is doing that from that side one score to give votes of thanks good morning i'm Sandra from tree branch and on behalf of the rest of the wings to fly scholars we want to thank you professor in a special way for the great concern and care that you have for us. You could have meant somewhere else, at least our public company. You could be doing something else, enjoyable, enjoying the fruits of your hard work. But you have sacrificed your time to come and show us. It's not a right, it's a privilege. And in a special way, we appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I wish to pass uh, so that we can move to the next step. And thank you so much for your patience and your cooperation. So, thank you very much, George. Uh, scholars, they can exhaust you within the time arrangements that we have. But we are now having a discussion with uh, the Vice Chancellor. Um, now, if you have any questions, and I know you have, if you could prepare those questions, questions for President Clinton, you write them down on the piece of the agreement, even write and we will be able to present questions to him at technical university he will be able to respond to all of them in writing share with us his responses and then we shall send them to you through the branch managers near your schools is that okay? so that as you make your choices you are making your choices for an informed uh, position. And I can assure you, the information you are getting, your teachers may not have enough of it. And therefore, like I said, you will be the career consultant in your school. Because you have more information than the information that is available in the schools. So thank you very much, Professor, even for your kindness coming I want to request George to escort you so that I can introduce the next guest. And uh, George, I have not given Professor a cup of tea, so give him a cup of tea. Thank you, thank you very much, thank you. Much. And now, I have the pleasure to introduce to you our director. His name is Elma. Elma. E L M A R. 
W. Amendments. I know I have this one now, so that's why I'm looking at him. So that I can correct uh, I can correct me. So that's why I'm equipped with the correct organization. Um, he has uh, an area in equity group, which is called Project Governance. He is in charge of architecture, business architecture in the bank. I know you have an idea about architecture and building. In a business and you can see the diversity of the career opportunities in equal bank. And since I also don't understand properly what he does, Elma, I'll also be hearing a lot from you. And what I also want you to notice is that our equity group is a universe. Everybody from the universe is in equity. And therefore, that's why when you are tying yourself to your village, you are being next, or even to your country, and sometimes in the cocoons, you are doing a lot of service to yourself. Therefore, Elmer, I want to welcome you to come and share with the senior scholars in the rooms to try to program who are form three and form four. Put your hands together for Director Elmer. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to share some of my experiences as a career choice of really in life. Um, right now, I am involved in uh, information technology, but that's not where I started my career. Um, I'll let you first give a little bit of my background. Um, my name is Alma, which is German, and my surname is Van Ongers, which actually means from Ongers, uh, and that is Dutch. Uh, it's very fortunate uh, if you think about the Football World Cup. I uh, suppose uh, the third one, uh, which was Nigeria, because I spent some time working on Nigeria as well, so I uh, supported Nigeria. Uh, I hope that Kino will be on the next Football World Cup as well. <laughs> so, so let me tell you a little bit about my career path. I actually started off studying quantity survey, um, which is a construction and architectural discipline. Uh, it's all about uh, quantifying the cost of buildings and the feasibility of buildings uh, or construction projects um to see if uh, it, it will make money over a long time uh, you calculate what the return on the investment is etc but i really sh soon realized that i did not enjoy that very much so i studied uh, cost and management accounting as well and then started working for a company called Cal company that makes breakfast cereal so i moved from construction into accounting and um, it was also at Cairo Company that I was introduced to IT. So I moved again. I moved from accounting into IT. And that was when my career started uh, in, in nearest the track where I am today. Um, I got involved into an area called Enterprise Resource Planning. And what that is all about is providing business systems for uh, companies where you basically provide HR financial systems, manufacturing systems, project accounting systems. So really the backbone of what runs a business. And I basically spent 20 years doing that. And that built up my career to where it is today. And in a very um, a strange way, there is still a connection to architecture. If we think about architecture, Buildings are different. If you look at this sports stadium, it is quite different to a, a large uh, commercial building, to a shopping mall. 
we have different components to business, uh, to uh, the architecture. And in the same way, business architecture works. Um, this, uh, business architecture is made up of uh, uh, enterprise architecture, which consists business architecture, information, and te technical architecture. And why is that important? Look at a badly planned building. There is actually a building in the United States that my colleague, Rafael uh, Fukai, always uh, is in the CIA. He always refers to the Winchester House of uh, Mystery. Uh, this specific house in the US, the owner spent uh, the equivalent of $200 million to buy a house that has a window working into a room and a door that basically go away where you will get injured. And the reason for that is bad architecture. And the same way, if a business does not have a proper architecture, then it does not operate uh, well. So in IT terms, what we do is we design that architecture for the business. And that architecture would be di different for various kinds of businesses. If we see the bank and the telecommunications company are different. So the business and that enterprise architecture would look different. Uh, um, opportunities for you one day. Security, infrastructure, software engineering, business applications, databases, and then all the emerging technologies around business intelligence, if we think about big data and um, analytics, machine learning. These are all extremely exciting and uh, challenging uh, areas of business. Um, equity Bank currently use some of these technologies to use social media to try and predict what our customers will want next. So if you go into a shop we you really know that uh, you prefer a certain kind of products and we can help you and assist you and lead you to make decisions. But Preferences. What I'm going to actually show you here as well is not to be afraid about the choice of your initial study. As you can see, in my career path, I changed twice. And a lot of the learning that I've done was basically research that you do yourself. You can, by uh, using uh, you know, information out there on the uh, internet, you can enlighten yourself and educate yourself in many ways. Almost every uh, career path that you think of these days, if you go on Google, you can find top quality information on the internet. Many of the top universities like Harvard and Stanford actually publish a lot of their classes on YouTube and on uh, electronic media. And this is also where I want to uh, say to you that the bank is currently putting uh, Wi-Fi into the branches and to the entrances of the bank. So that learning content is available to you. It is up to ourselves to enrich ourselves by taking advantage of all of this knowledge that is available. Today, I can tell you that most of our work training online and by self research. We teach that to our staff that um, on Saturdays we try and do professional development where we say, they spend at least two to four hours doing research to stay here and to stay in line with modern technology. Technology has become very similar to the medical science, where if you do not keep up to date with the advances in technology, they will very quickly become obsolete. So, with that many years, what I would like to do is to encourage you to, to take um, real advantage of all of those opportunities that exist on the way and in terms of the technology. And it's not restricted to just information technology. If you are interested in absolutely anything, you will be able to find information on the way these days. So, with that, I will take a number of questions. Thank you very much.
Okay, any questions uh, from the inside? No questions. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I do not have a lot of time for the time. I feel free to visit our branches that we are doing our work. Customers and I really welcome to the information to make useful information after the content. I have been to uh, um, encourage you in the studies going on and I really feel excited for the amount of opportunities that I have ahead for you in your careers. Thank you very much. ICT and I'm very sure by the head of this conference what we have shared and the things we have shared we are very well equipped with the ICT strategy for the bank. Has somebody given to you?
we have Professor Masoya. He will tell you a lot of professors and all that. And therefore, he will tell you what he does, the journey he has gone through, and share with you some further tips on careers. But he is a professor of medicine and a practicing professor of medicine. And uh, Professor is also a member of the Group Board. You have the chairman, Peter Moka, yesterday. And now this is one of the group members of Equity Group. And we want to thank you, Professor, for spending your labor day with the scholars. We have from three Thank you. The ones who are accompanying with a cheer, they are spiking ladies, I guess. Uh, from Freeze Wave at Professor. Ah, thank you very much. Professor, you are most welcome. Come and share with them. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, uh, equity scholars. Beautiful. It's a beautiful morning. It's not hot. It's cool, it's raining, so I'm sure all of us are awake. And I'll ask um, somebody to load my presentation. It's uh, going to be a short uh, presentation, and I do hope that we shall have adequate time to interact where I can answer your questions. And I was asked to talk to you about leadership and giving building a successful career. I can't pretend to know everything about building a successful career. I think I have had a very successful career. So I can share a little bit of my experience with you. And I would just like to start by advancing my slide. I don't know whether this is Working okay, so I'm just going to this topic in these four broad uh, areas just a little bit of introduction and then I'll touch on leadership. I'm sure the whole week uh, you've had a lot of uh, talk on leadership. I'll talk about building a successful career and, of course, service because this is the theme of this year's conference. Technology is, sorry, is fairly new. I'll start by talking a little bit about myself. As you heard, my name is Maria uh, Machelo. I am a professor of ENT. For the information, the Greek word for ENT, ENT starts for ear, nose, and throat, is auto, rhino, Laryngology. Auto is ear, rhino is nose, and laryngology is throat. You know, medicine has a lot of um, origins in, uh, in, in Greece, and a lot of medical words are derived from Greek words. So I am an auto rhino laryngologist. Now, of course, I didn't start as an auto rhino laryngologist. I started like you. My journey to where I am started about uh, maybe 40, uh, 50 years ago when I joined the uh, primary school in a small village in Rwanda. Up to 1972, when I went to Thika High School. Anybody who is in Thika High School? Beautiful. Thank you very much. So those from Thika High School, I sat in the old dining room. I know you have a new dining room because I'm a member of the school uh, board. And I sat on some very old benches, walked to the dusty parts, 
from the main school to the dormitories. Those days, of course, being in Form 1, there was a lot of um, what we used to call monopolization. So we did suffer, and some of my colleagues left school because they couldn't stand. They said it was too much. They were being brutalized. Looking back, I think it was a little bit brutal, but it was also part of uh, character formation. One of the most important things that I remember and I took from Tika High School was the fact that we were all very highly motivated. Joining from one, when we are being welcome, we were told that the sky was the limit and that we could go anywhere that we wanted, we could become whatever we wanted. Initially, as a Form 1, this did not make sense to us. But as I progressed, I realized that the school had a very, very strong culture, had a very strong uh, science culture, had a culture of achievement. And because of this, when we were in Form 4, those days there was Form 5 and 6, we all aspired to go back to the school and for Form 5 and 6. And to show how good we had connected with the school, almost all of us chose that school as our number one choice for Form 5. And true enough, majority of us went back to Thika High School, did Form 5 and 6. Those days we had to make our decisions in Form 4 whether you are going to be a scientist or an artist. It was what was called a dichotomous education. And although, for example, I used to enjoy history a lot, I used to enjoy religious education, in Form 5 and 6, I had to choose to do biology, chemistry, and, um, uh, and physics, because these were the subjects that were needed in university for me to become a doctor. In Form 5 and 6, we matured a lot because then we were introduced to working on your own. And it was a time that we actually farmed up what we wanted to do in the university. Our performance in Form 6 was nothing but phenomenal because 95% of the students went to university. To make it even better, in the School of Medicine, where we had 120 students, 16 of these students came from Thika High School. So in undergraduates, the lecturers used to call us the pineapple boys because of the pineapples in Thika. And because we had gone to university quite a good number of us and gone to do medicine, we had a very tight group, which was very supportive. And all of us finished our medical uh, training in five years. As when you go to university, you realize that um, going to university is not graduating. And it was a rude awakening for some of us when first we took exams in the university and you got 30%. And you're used to 80 and 90 percent. The freedom that you get when you go to university, of course, did contribute. Sometimes we were not able to pace ourselves to prepare for end of term exams. Fast forward to my uh, career as a doctor. After Thika, I went to do my internship in Nakuru for one year. And uh, like I tell all my students today, your learning of medicine starts when you become an intern. Because when you're a medical student, mostly the, the most you can do is maybe take a blood sample, examine a patient. But once you start being an intern, you are in charge. At 4.30 a.m., you are called in. There's a patient who is collapsed. Everybody else is asleep except you and the nurse. You have to make a decision you have to institute treatment. Initially, of course, we feared, we knew that we had been well trained, but we realized we had a lot of uh, things that we knew in theory, things that we had seen other people do, 
and we thought they were easy. Like getting a vein in a two or three year old baby, the veins are very small, you struggle for about three, four hours to get a vein so that you can give drugs. And then as an intern, because you are not many, sometimes you work for 36 hours continuously. But I consider that as part of my best part of my medical career. Because that is when I really became a doctor. That is when I developed my values. That is when I knew how do I talk to somebody sometimes who is very distraught, sometimes has lost a loved one, they are desperate, they don't know whether they're going to get well, they're in pain. So you find that you develop compassion. After internship, I went to work in Meru. And while in Meru, I was posted to work in Moyale. There must be some students here from Moyale. I worked in Moyale in 1983 as a medical officer. And uh, those days was when the new hospital, the so-called Nyaya Awards, were being built. Again, in Moyale, it was a very, very challenging time because uh, I was a young doctor. I was the only doctor transporting transport from Moyare to uh, Isioro was very difficult. There was a lot of corrugation. We had to travel in lollies. The hospitals, there was no electricity. We were using batteries. A diesel generator. Fuel would run out. But you still have to operate. I do remember many times operating with torches. You get three torches for you. These days, when you have to do an operation, you have somebody else who is called an anesthetist who puts the patient to sleep so that the surgeon can operate. In Moyale, we had no anesthetist. So what we had to do is, uh, as the doctor, I would pay, put the patient to sleep and then start the operation. If the patient started waking up, I will go and add some more medicine. But the most challenging thing was sometimes when we got cases that we didn't really, I had not been exposed to. And these patients would not be transferable to places like Meru or Kenyatta because there was no transport. We would have to wait for the arm referring doctors. But good enough, there was also good communication. We had, um, we had a radio. And many times I was guided through surgeries by doctors in AMREF. Today, those of you who will become doctors, there is something which is called telemedicine, that you can practice medicine under the guidance of somebody who could even be in America. So telemedicine has made medical practice much better, has taken specialists to the remotest parts of the world. Those days, we used radio call, and I would hook the radio in theater, and this doctor in Amref would take me through the steps. Again, for those of my colleagues that uh, did not work in such remote areas, when we came back to do our postgraduate, and I was telling them my exploits, they could not believe it. And they, they started feeling like they missed something. Yes, they did miss something. They did miss an element of innovation that you can only learn when you work in certain areas, when you work in the rural areas. And as you start thinking about your career, and you start thinking about that you can only get the best if you are working in a big city, in a metropolis, you are very long. Because lessons for us are all over. You never know where you will shine, whether in a big city, whether even in a small village. As long as, as I will talk about later on, you have passion for what you do. To become an ENT surgeon, of course, I needed to uh, train another five, uh, three, uh, four years. These days, it takes five years. And after five years, I became a specialist ENT surgeon. Again, my first posting was in Machakos. Any people from Machakos County? Thank you. 
Then after one year in Machakos, I joined the university as a lecturer. And it has been, you know, a, a long journey to become a professor. It means that I have had to show that I can provide the leadership in my specialized field by doing research, by writing and publishing, and generally being a professional leader. There are various steps to become a professor. You start as a lecturer, you become a senior lecturer, you become an associate professor, and you become a professor. Now, when I look back at the young boy from Ruro Muranga, standing in front of you today as a professor of medicine, I know that I am looking at tomorrow's professor because you all come from such humble abodes as I did. I wore my first pair of shoes when I was in Standard 6. Many of you are already, I mean, wore your shoes before you went to Standard 1. But that did not prevent me getting where I am. So I want you to know that with education, the sky is the limit because there is nothing else that has enabled me to get where I am apart from education. Nothing else. When I look at even the international um, uh, jobs that I have done, I am currently the Secretary General for our International Association for Africa and the Middle East, which is really a big honor. Again, I could not think 30, 40 years ago that it was possible to be there. But I'll tell you, I have remained focused and have not shied away from taking challenges. Last year, I was appointed a director of Equity Bank. Again, it's not something that I had plotted. It is not something I ever thought about. It gives me a totally different challenge from medicine to sit in an, a banking uh, institution's board. I had, I have to, to learn, I have to learn the terms that are used in banking. But again, it is not a daunting task. I don't shy away. I have now learned how to read a balance sheet. But that not, has not made me a lesser surgeon. All that it has done, it has broadened my experience. That is in a nutshell, nutshell about me. It is not fair that we discuss about me and we don't discuss about you. Don't you think so? So a little bit about yourselves. I know that you are academically gifted because that's why you are here, uh, being an equity scholar if you are not gifted. I know that you have, a lot of you have had challenging backgrounds. And I know that a lot of you have overcome many challenges to be where you are. And I know that you have a great desire to have a better life. True or false? Otherwise, you wouldn't be here, isn't it? I understand how um, um, usually there are about 15,000 to 20,000 applicants to become uh, equity scholars. And you must have taken the initiative to apply and to be interviewed. Therefore, you already had a desire to have a better life. And I know that you are determined and that you are focused because when you take the challenges that many of you had in your primary school, to, for you to have been able to overcome these challenges, you must have determined and focused. And the other thing is, I know that you are a chosen few because if there were 15,000 applicants or 20,000, last year I was told there were 20,000, and I think uh, only 2,000 are taken, then you must be a chosen few. And I know that you will be champions of change. 
But then, when I know all those things, then I remember the saying, to those that much has been given, a lot will be expected from them. And I think it's very important, as you grow, you grow in um, academically, as later on you grow in your career, that you should never forget that. That all these attributes about you mean that you have been given a lot, and a lot will be expected from you. And that is why I like the theme of um, uh, this Congress about leadership and giving. Because we expect a lot from our leaders in whatever sphere, and therefore a lot will be expected from you. Now that we know each other, and before I leave, you will tell me a little bit of yourself that I have not included, we can look at some of the things that we need uh, to talk about today. And I want to ask you, are you a leader? Are you a leader? Maybe I was wrong because I said that I thought being an equal of you, a potential leader. Because you stand out, many in your villages and your counties look up to you, and you may not know it, you are all role models. I remember when I went to high school, one of the things that I, I wanted is I never wanted to preach. For two reasons. One, I wanted to carry a box. I wanted to get into a bus. And two, the school that was near my village, near my primary school, they used to have cross country. And they would pass by our primary school. And we would start at the fence and jeer at those that came last. And since I was not a very good sportsman, I was not a good runner, I never wanted the, the children in the primary school to jeer at me. And you can imagine that motivation, that desire to get out of the village, made me work very hard. And that's how I, I ended up in Fika High School. But I know that every opening day, the young uh, primary school boys and girls in the village envied me when they saw me carrying my box, going to go into a bus. And therefore, I became a role model. And the parents in the village would tell their children, work as hard as so and so, so that you can go into, uh, you can go to a high school. You don't know how many households in your village your name is constantly mentioned because you are role models. So uphold that position of being a role model. Maybe it's good to look at, to think about what is leadership? Because you may be thinking, why is Professor asking us whether we are leaders? You would have social influence. A leader will have social influence. A leader will be able to enlist the aid and support of others in accomplishing common goals. And a leader will be inspirational. Through their actions, they will inspire others so that they dream more, they learn more, and they do more, and become, uh, become more in their life. That is a leader. If you see these attributes and ask yourself whether you have these attributes, then you know you are a leader, but your cruising is up. You're not taking up your challenge.
uh, your friends that are knowledgeable. It's always good to discuss what you want to. It helps you form a clear picture when you discuss something, when you exchange. Don't rule out discussions and being assisted sometimes so that you have a better focus. I know one time a young person uh, I was talking to, very young, I think in uh, high school, uh, and I asked him, what would you like to become when you grow up? And he said, I want to become a manager. To this young person, he had known that a manager is a very important person. But how do you become a manager? What will you be managing? How do you start? How many people as are employed as managers? Did he know that? That to become a manager, you must work your way up. You must distinguish yourself. Now, in the course of discussion, then this young person starts seeing what it is that is required for somebody to become a manager. At the end of every year, uh, when there used to be ranking for schools, the best students would be interviewed by newspapers or radios, and they would be asked, what do you want to be? I want to be a neurosurgeon. I want to be a pediatrician. But this, these young people, do they know at that particular time that to be a neurosurgeon, to be an ENT surgeon, you first must be a doctor. And again, I remember uh, uh, giving a talk somewhere, and a student put up their hands and they asked, what do I need to become? I want to become uh, an ENT surgeon like you. What do I need? So when I explained to them, you do your five years of uh, basic medicine, you do one year of internship, you do two years as a medical officer, then you come back and do five years. He counted the years, there were 12 years. He said, I didn't know that it takes that long. But that's what he had been talking about. So when you get advice from people, they'll be able to tell you what does it take. So foundation. Then develop a roadmap. Where do you want to be? Where do you want to go? And how do you get there? This morning as I was coming here, I made one long turn. And that one wrong turn meant that I had to go and drive past Kenyatta University to be able to get back here. Part of it is that although I knew I was coming to Kasarani Gymnasium, I had not plotted my journey very well. I took it for granted that I know this road. And I think I had a little bit of distraction and I missed the turn. And that will also happen in your career. That you have, you need a roadmap so that you follow that roadmap as you build your career. When you miss your turns, it derails you. It means sometimes that you have to spend much longer to achieve what you wanted. So follow a roadmap. And that roadmap is the one that you tell you, if you're in Nairobi, you can't get to Thika unless you pass via Kasarani or you pass via Kiambu, or you pass via, there's no way you're going to get to Thika without the inconvenience of passing through certain other areas. So as you uh, build your career, you must, in your roadmap, look at all those inconveniences. And I like to quote a saying that, uh, from uh, uh, Seneca that says that if a man does not know what port he's steering, no wind is favorable to him. That means, for those of you who come from coastal areas, near seas, you know that boats have, uh, before, before we got, they got motorized, they used to use sails. You know that those that used uh, to come from um, Saudi Arabia to the coast of Kenya, they would use the monsoon wood, uh, weeds. And because the weeds changed direction, they had to know when do we start our journey so that our sails are pointed towards where we are going. Now, what this means is you must point your sails to where you want to go. If you don't know where you are going, then you cannot point your sails. And no weed will help you to get where you are going. 
Because you put your sails in the ocean, you put your boat in the ocean, the wind will blow it to the direction that the wind is going. And that's where you will add. And when you add up there, although there was wind, the wind was not useful to you. So remember this, that you need to point yourselves to the direction that you want to go. Then you must set your expectations. But these expectations must be realistic. And they must be like a step ladder. You cannot expect to be at the top of the ladder if you don't, did not take the first step, the step at the bottom. You must know what is realistically possible. You want to be a musician or you want to be in showbiz, but you have a, a voice that is not very good. When you sing in your shower, your notes are out of sync, but you have uh, said you want a career in music. Like I said, you will have looked at yourself, but you must set your realistic expectations. That look, the way I am, I will not be, a, uh, I will not be a blockbuster. But you can still be in the music industry, even though you are not a musician, because you can be a producer, you can be a promoter, right? So you would be still close to what you wanted to do. That is what realistic expectations mean. And you know, if you set expectations that you want, don't want to sacrifice, then you are forgetting that tomorrow's success depends on today's sacrifices. So as a student, you must sacrifice something. You must sacrifice, um, you, 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 you must sit in and read, whereas it will be more appealing for you to go and, you know, just run around the field, read the uh, uh, novels, and generally have a good time. You have to sacrifice that good time today for a better tomorrow. You need to continuously evaluate your goals. Because as your mind becomes clearer, as you get to know more about um, your career, you adjust your goals. Franklin D. Roosevelt was one of the most successful American presidents. And he said that you keep your eyes on the stars, but your feet on the ground. That is an emphasis of having expectations, but being realistic, setting realistic expectations. Values. The values that you set yourself become a reference point for you. The values that you start living by will impact on your career because they will always be bring you back to the central point. Your values will develop over time and your values define who you are. And they define, they define what you believe in. They define what can you sacrifice to achieve whatever you want to achieve. When you have good values, you know there are certain things, they may be very appealing, but I will not sacrifice your values. I'll give you an example from medicine. Termination of pregnancy is illegal. But termination of pre pregnancy goes on in the back street. And termination of pregnancy involves health workers. Because it's quick money. If you have no value for life, you'll find yourself going for the quick money, terminating pregnancies illegally, endangering the life of young girls. But if you have the right value, the young girl, a young girl will come to you and want termination. You will cancel that girl out of that intention because of your values. Because you are not willing to sacrifice passion. There is no greatness 
without a passion to be great. Whether it's the aspiration of an athlete or an artist, a scientist, a parent, or a business person. That is where, when you look at yourself, you want to do something that you are passionate in. You want a career in which they're doing something that you really like doing. Because when you do what you really like doing, you do it well. You become good at it. When you become good at something, you feel good yourself. Because you get this good, feel good factor. And you become even better. So passion, where is your passion? What are you passionate about? Because passion is a great driver for successful careers. Competence. How can you be successful without being competent? You must develop and nurture the necessary skills in your career. And being able to nurture the necessary skills in your career starts now as a student. Because it means you have to work hard at it. You have to develop a good work ethic. If you don't develop good work ethic, then you're not going to be competent. Because to be competent, you have to do many, many, many times, over and over again. There is a theory that says, for you to get good at anything, you need to have spent 10,000 hours practicing it. And it's true. If, for example, you are a surgeon and you want to do an operation, you start by making an incision. Initially, your heart may be shaking. Initially, your incision may be a little bit crooked. It may not, you don't know exactly how much force you should apply on it. With the time, you get to know that if you hold the knife in a certain direction, you will make a very clean incision. You know how much force do I put on this incision? For example, if you're doing a cesarean section, the baby is lying there, the mother's uh, lower abdomen is, uh, um, is lifted up, and if you put too much force, you may cut through the skin, cut through the uterus, and harm the baby, and this has happened. A baby has, babies have come, back, come out with the uh, cuts inflicted by surgeons because the surgeon did not know how much uh, force to apply. Now, to know the exact force, you will get to know it because of repeated, uh, repeatedly doing that surgery. When, we, when I was a young doctor, we worked, I said, I told you I worked in Meru. And because the, the population of Meru, the district hospital, serves a very big area. And uh, we had to do a lot of cesarean sections, uh, 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 ladies with the problems in delivery. When I first went to Meru, a cesarean section for a young doctor would take maybe one hour. What we call skin to skin, that is making the incision and closing the wood, would take about one hour, one hour, 15 minutes. That is after your first year in internship. By the time we, fish, we finished one year in Meru, because sometimes we would do 12 Sicilian sections in a night, we were doing one Sicilian section in 29 minutes, skin to skin, because you know the steps, you know exactly what you should do when, you have worked with a nurse who knows what do you need next. So uh, developing and nurturing skills, and it is the same thing today as a student, you must read and read and read again and practice and practice. Those of you who are um, inclined towards, towards the sciences, you may know about those, especially who are in Form 4, may know about titration in chemistry. To titrate to the end point, you need very steady hands, you need a lot of practice so that you titrate within the, a very, very small margin of the end point. Again, you cannot do that unless you do it again and again. So in a career, continuous learning and self-improvement. Because things that you learn at the beginning of your career will become obsolete. 
Again, I would draw from the field of medicine. By the time you qualify as a doctor, within about five years, 50% of what you learned in medical school has changed. New drugs have come in, new ways of uh, doing this has come, come in. So to remain a successful doctor, you must continuously develop yourself, you must continuously learn. And it applies whether you are a lawyer, whether you are an engineer. So you must commit yourself uh, to continuous learning and self-improvement. So commitment is very important in building a successful career. Mentorship. Throughout your career, and it starts now from high school, it is important to identify mentors. And you identify mentors at various stages in your career. Because these mentors will work with you. They will most of the times give you advice which is objective, which is not subjective. They will point you in the right direction. You'll find mentors will be from different backgrounds. Today in high school, your mentor may be your class teacher, may be another teacher, a sports teacher, may be uh, a counselor in the school, may be an administrator in the school. So you need to identify your mentors. And you need to identify them carefully because they need to add value to your life. As you go on in your career, you'll find that at a certain time in your career, you need a certain type of mentor. Even I have mentors, and I mentor many people, but I also have a mentor in different things. When I was appointed to Equity Board, it's a different career for me. It's something I don't know. I have to look for a mentor in banking, somebody who will be able to point me and hold my hand. I have to get a mentor. So if after 40 years of working, I still am still looking for mentors to surmount challenges that are ahead of me, what about you who is just starting? It's very important to have mentors. Why do I put respect as one of the important ingredients for a successful career? Because you need to respect roles. You need to have respect for authority and respect for others. There are very many brilliant people in organizations who don't get very far because they have no respect for authority. They have no respect for other people. So when people are assessing them, they give them very poor grades for people skills, for respect for authority, for if you are told that uh, this is the organization's rules, you are supposed to abide by them, you don't respect. So learn to respect authority today when you are in school. Because that uh, value of respect will become very important to you as you build your career. Integrity. How can you have a successful career if you are a person of low integrity? And integrity begets respect from others. Integrity allows us to build trust. And integrity produces fairness. Since we said you, are, you want to build a successful career, and we say that when you build a successful career, you are going to end up as a leader. Then others must see fairness in you as a leader. And fairness means that you have a very high sense of integrity. You all know about issues of integrity in our country. You know issues, for example, last year we had with police recruitment. That was lack of integrity. So you recruit the wrong people. So you'll never get the, uh, the job well done because there was no fairness. I am sure most of you have seen the heart of integrity in the process of selecting equity scholars. That by and large, the people who were involved in this process had a very high sense of integrity because if they didn't have, you will not be sitting here. They would have taken the, the children of the rich, 
the children of the powerful because they would have been able to influence them. But because this, the, the process has a very high level of integrity and the people chosen have integrity, you are there. And you therefore, I am sure, you respect the process, you respect the people that have put this program together. So aspire to be a person of integrity so that you'll be respected and you'll be fair to other people. Then confidence. Who will believe in you if you don't believe in yourself? You want to have a successful career. You must have confidence. You must believe in yourself. Because if you don't believe in yourself, who else? And like Richard Barth said, that sooner or later, those who win are those who think that they can. So if you think that you can't, 